All right, everybody. Hey, it's great that you join us here. Uh, can't wait till we're meeting in person and hopefully that's gonna happen sooner than later, but I'm super excited that so many of you are continuing to follow along as we go through this amazing book of Romans. The only little housekeeping thing I have for you tonight is there is a problem with our email server right now. So if you're trying to reach me on Daynard at kawaiichristian.org. Uh, it's not working. If you need to reach me, uh, use my other email address. It is danespore at mac.com or danespore at me.com. It doesn't matter. Uh, and feel free to email me with questions or comments on tonight's study or any study. And um, I'll even be happy to read them out if they're good or interesting or good questions. Maybe I'll answer them next week. But let's go ahead and jump right into um, Romans chapter 12 and a half, I'm going to say. And I want to begin by just telling you a brief story. It goes back to 2016. It was actually the week before the 2016 election. And a gentleman came up to me after Bible study one night, and he was clearly deeply concerned. And he said, man, I just don't know who to vote for in this election. And he was very stressed out. And he asked me, who do I vote for? And here's what I told him. I said, listen, whatever, whoever you vote for, I just don't want you to be sitting there in that voting booth as if Jesus is standing over your shoulder, looking over your shoulder. And when you vote, he says either, oh man, guy calls himself a Christian and votes for that guy. Or he goes, oh, that a boy, way to vote for him. I said, I think God might have bigger concerns for your life than who you vote for, but you should investigate it and blah, 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 blah. However, what I want to share with you tonight is I, you know, considered that for a long time because I as well was very conflicted about who to vote for. So I kind of had an imaginary conversation with Jesus. Now, this isn't like I heard the audible voice of Christ, just sort of in my head. I envisioned myself. What would Jesus say if I asked him who I should vote for? And I would just, here's my imaginary conversation with Jesus. I was like, Jesus, who do I vote for? And Jesus says, Dane, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who found a treasure in a field. And he went out and with great joy bought that field. And I was like, okay, thank you, Jesus. But um, who do I vote for? And Jesus says, Dane, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which even though the being of the smallest seeds, once planted in the garden, it grows into a huge tree and, you know, the birds of the air come and nest in it. And I'm like, Jesus, um... Are you saying that maybe the kingdom's more important? And Jesus said, you are close to the kingdom, Dane. Anyways, I just want to share that story with you briefly because we're going to be talking a lot about Christians and government tonight. Oh boy, it's almost a good thing we don't have anybody here, huh? The conversation could go on for days. But in any case, brief review to get started. After eight chapters of everything God has done to save us, having done all the work Paul turns the corner in chapter 12 to explain the logic of following God, the logic of giving your life over to God, who clearly knows the way to eternal life, meaning not just heaven, but a full, abundant, and meaningful life even now in this place. And as he sets out to show what that life looks like, what seems to be of most vital importance to God, backed by almost all of Paul's letter, is humility, letters, I should say, is humility, and the unity of the believers. So last week, we began with this concept of humility and the idea that if we are all sinners saved by grace, what do I have to boast about? Of course, the answer is nothing. Paul then shows how God uniquely gifts each person for specific tasks in his kingdom. So nobody can boast about being great in the kingdom or having a greater gift in the kingdom, but all serving in gifts is all rooted in humility and love. And then he closed with a particularly interesting commandment from Paul, which is um, the Greek word xenophilia, the love of strangers. And we thought that was a specific challenge for us here at Kauai Christian Fellowship because we have so many visitors coming to visit us all the time. And so tonight we're going to learn how to continue living out this life in the kingdom of God, but with some really specific challenges. And it begins with how do we live with those who are against us? And so join me in chapter 12. We'll start in verse 14. Um, uh, I can't see in this light. Oh, here we are. Okay. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Now, a lot of scholars have tried to figure out who Paul specifically was talking about in this instant, who is being persecuted. 
Uh, John MacArthur believes this is specifically about persecution we receive from non-Christians, but as that is a starting point, because as it descends down into the verses below, he begins with saying those who persecute you, but he ends up um, saying do not be overcome by evil. So from like basic persecution all the way to evil, it seems to be a descending ladder. And in this case, he says, um, do not, do not curse. What he means by that is do not desire damnation. In other words, bless those who persecute you and do not deem them to be damned into hell, um, which is kind of perfect because we are to be loving people and attempting to love them into the kingdom of God, whether they be enemy or not. Because remember, when we were yet enemies of God, Jesus Christ died for our sins. And so therefore we should not desire people to go to hell, even those who persecute us, but to, to desire their salvation instead. I mean, even Jesus Christ, who himself was persecuted unto death on a cross, said, forgive them, Father, right? Um, uh, it's easy these days to sort of um, wish bad upon those who persecute us, um, but we are to actually be praying for them. In fact, uh, I wanted to share this with you tonight. I know I've shared it a little bit in the past, um, but God really convicted my heart um, towards my, um, my attitude towards those who were opponents of the Christian faith. And early on in my faith, I sort of adopted an us versus them attitude until I read these verses in Ephesians chapter four. They are darkened in their understanding separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. And it basically says, if I could sum that up, they are darkened, dead, and dumb. Yeah. In other words, they don't have all the benefits of the Holy Spirit that I enjoy, which says, you know, God, I've been given the light of God. I have been explained the truth. God has opened my eyes to see and understand and therefore, these people who don't know the Lord, rather than be sort of offended by them, rather than me wanting to strike back against them, I need to have mercy and compassion on them the way Christ had mercy, mercy and has mercy and compassion on me and pray for their salvation. Um, people are not stupid and they're, most of them are not necessarily mal, you know, intentionally evil but they are deceived. They are like sheep without a shepherd, blind men without a guide. We have an opportunity to be a light into the world to those who are darkened, okay? So verse 15 then continues and said, says, rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. Now that's a really a basic teaching. I don't need to like go into that, you know, be happy with those who are happy and mourn with those who mourn. It's basically just, you know, Paul's way of saying emphasize, empathize, not just sympathize, but empathize with empa, empa, empha. How do you say it, Tom? Empa. Empathize. Empathize, not empathize. <laughs> empathize with people. And by the way, I, thinking about this, if I can make fun of myself here for, uh, real quickly, I discovered when I thought about this, I, it's probably easier for me to mourn with people than to rejoice with people. And does that sound crazy? Well, no, not really, because think about it. If a good friend of yours maybe had a re close relative die or something, I can come to them and be like, hey, man, I am so sorry. My heart breaks for you, even though I didn't know your, you know, Uncle Ernie or whatever. You know, my heart breaks for you and I'll be praying for you. But if, you know, somebody comes up to you and they're like, dude, I just won the lottery, you know? Oh, why you? <laughs> it might be sometimes harder. In fact, real funny story. One time, did I mention I broke my arm? <laughs> One time, those of you that know, I've been coming here for a while. I remember when I broke my arm and it's all I talked about for the six months that I was out of the water. But yeah, I broke my arm and I'm at church one Sunday and I've got a cast. Picture this from here, from the top of my shoulder, all the way to my fingertips. And it's a big cast. I mean, it's like that big around this huge thing. Plus I was in a sling and I'm standing outside the foyer here. And this gentleman comes up to me and he goes, dude, the surf's been so good, man. He goes, have you been scoring? And I'm like, bro, do you see this? And then like, he literally looks down and goes, oh, dude, this is like the best summer. I've been scoring such good waves. Now, let me tell you, at that moment, rejoicing with him was more difficult than if he came up and said, my uncle Ernie died and I, can I, you know, can I pray for you? Yeah. But anyways, 
um, we are to rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. Not a complicated topic there. Let's get to something different. Verse 16. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position and do not be conceited. Again, a, a basic teaching, the repetition of this idea of being um, humble and not being proud. Now, in Paul's context, when it says people of low position, that would have, I think, been more of an issue of wealth than we even face in our society. In our society, I know we have wealthy people and, and poor people, but, you know, like when I look around the room here on a Sunday morning, eh, you know, in, you know, in the world's economy, we're actually all pretty darn um, wealthy. It would have been a much bigger deal, a social strata deal um, in Paul's time uh, than it is now. So in our society, I would like to submit to you um, that not even think about it so much as money, but just perhaps in reputation uh, or even race or, or creed. Eh, creed, I'm getting, anyways. But my point is, is this. Um, we are to not be proud and to associate with all, everybody in society, basically like that, and not to sort of lord it over anybody, okay? Um, let's keep going. Verse 17, because those are all pretty basic teachings that I know most of you understand. And I could unpack each word in the Greek or whatever, but you get it. Okay, verse 17. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everybody. In fact, I'm going to read all the way down to 21. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Okay, I kind of bit off a big chunk there, but most of you know this already. And again, we could argue about the little bits and pieces in that section, but basically you get the gist of it. Don't repay evil with evil, but love even those who persecute you. It's sort of summed up perfectly in the end. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. But um, it works its way out in a variety of ways. Um, he says, let God deal with it. Um, and you know, by the way, God's wrath is usually not to throw thunderbolts, as we saw from chapters one and two, but people who are out busy involved in doing evil deeds pretty much end up reaping the results on their own anyways, whether or not we retaliate against him. Um, the, let him go, God will take care of that. Remember this too, God's wrath um, is always instructive, uh, not necessarily simply punitive. And so God will deal with people who persecute you um, and, and, and oppress you. But it does get a little bit tricky. We don't ever want to enable evil. And there are times when we are called to stand up against um, evil. However, we don't do so with vengeance ourselves. Um, but we, we try to actually love um, our enemies. Everybody um, needs love. Uh, everybody has an episode in their life where they need to be loved and where we have an opportunity to show Christ's love. And then regarding this, um, in doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. Um, I have seen a whole bunch of different explanations about what that means. Well, in ancient times, people used to carry a coal in their head to help, you know, to keep warm or whatever, or it sounds more like what it is, and that is... Um, <laughs> To, by doing good to those who persecute you, it's kind of like, yeah, see how, see how you like that. Because I don't think anybody really um, wants to have a burning coal on their head. Tons of different interpretations about that. Uh, you've probably seen a few of those in the Daily Bread or whatever. John MacArthur says, oh, that was an act of public contrition so that in doing good, showing them love will cause them shame. I thought that was a pretty good one. Um, but basically you will discover in your own life, as I will as well, that showing love to somebody who's been acting detrimental to you actually does something really good in your own heart. It is good for you and it is a great witness to them. And perhaps the best way I can say to do that and perhaps even the easiest, but I will say very effective way to do that is to pray for your adversaries. I mean that. Um, pray for your adversaries and go out of your way to be kind to them. 
Um, in a sense, what Paul is saying here is, what would Jesus do? And let me just pause there for a second to say this. That is a teaching you will find all through <laughs> daily breads and morning devotionals and sermons on a Sunday morning. Pray for your adversaries. Uh, but I never took that very seriously uh, for perhaps the first 10 years of my walk with Christ. And I discovered something interesting when I took that teaching to heart and I truly began to pray for those who were, I can't, you know, adversaries of mine, people just who were jerks to me or uncool to me, maybe burned me, uh, maybe ripped me off or whatever, this and that. Boy, did I discover two things. It helped me be more at ease in my heart to not be bitter towards them, but it also caused me to empathize with them, to begin to see and understand perhaps why they were the way they were, why they acted the way they acted. And I ended up discovering that in my interactions with them, by, by having that mindset of where they're coming from, I was able to interact with them on a much more positive way and saw some fruit in relationships from that and have actually become friends as time has gone on with people who at one time were very much not friends of mine. So I wanna encourage you for that, okay? So the basic teaching of that section is be loving, be kind, and even be good to those who are against us. Now it's gonna get much more sticky. Um, it's interesting, the topic we're going to go on right now, I wrote in my notes, it is actually beyond tricky um, because everybody, every one of you right now that is watching this video, and even Tom, who's behind the camera back there, all of us, I guarantee, will have a different opinion on where the Christian should draw the line when it comes to obeying our leaders. Uh, it's interesting because if you were all here in this room, uh, I probably would have just made this one whole night's topic because I guarantee everybody would have plenty to say. Uh, likely we would not all agree. However, we're going to go ahead and read the verses and let God's word instruct each one of us. Every one of you watching, I trust, uh, possesses the Holy Spirit. This is the word of God speaking to the Holy Spirit in you. Let's let him guide. Um, it begins like this in verse 13, chapter 13, verse 1, just the first part. Everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities. Now, let's just pause right there. Submit to the governing authorities. Think about Paul's situation. Paul's situation would have been completely different to, say, uh, an Old Testament prophet writing something similar, who at least was being ruled by fellow Israelites and fellow Jews. Paul is, at, is writing under the authority of a godless pagan nation of Rome. Uh, when he wrote this, he wasn't actually in prison, but he shortly would be in prison. Um, the same authority that he's talking about here when he says, submit himself to the governing authorities, uh, will later behead him and be throwing Christians to lions. Um, now, we kind of want to water down these verses by saying, yeah, but it's different now. Uh, but I want to submit to you, it would have been more difficult for Paul to write this than for a 21st century American to write this. Um, I will unpack that a little bit more a little bit later. But I want to point out to you that Paul offers no qualification and no conditionality. Is that a word? No condition to this, right? Um, in other scriptures, it says this. Paul writes to Timothy in chapter 2. I urge then, first of all, that all requests, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for everyone, for kings, and all of those in authority. Look what he just said. We should be praying interceding and even giving thanksgiving for kings and all those in authority that we may live that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness and in um, to Titus he wrote this in chapter 3 remind the people to be subject to rulers and authorities to be obedient and to be ready to do whatever is good now before we get into the because I know some of you are like, yeah, but I know there's a lot of people right now going, yeah, but hold your yeah, buts. Just let's get through this and we'll get to your yeah, buts here in just a second. Let's continue for the next part of uh, verse 13 all the way down to verse five. For there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. 
Consequent, by, look, did you notice he said that twice? There is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, he who rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. And those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from the fear of one in authority? Then do what is right and he will commend you. For he is God's servant to do you good. But if you do wrong, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword for nothing. He is God's servant, an agent of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible, possible punishment, but also because of conscience. Now, I'm going to sort of unpack that a little bit. Um, uh, and there is a difference between God giving authority and allowing those to have authority. In fact, I've, I wish you were all here to help me answer this question because I read this verse earlier this morning and I thought, you know, I've always assumed it was one way. Maybe it's another way. Just bear with me on this. You know what it says? There's no authority except that which God has established. Now, that's really interesting. I kind of always read that to, to believe that, for example, God chooses who will be the mayor of Kauai, the governor of Oahu, or the governor of the state of Hawaii, the president of the United States. I am actually not so sure now reading that verse. And here's what I mean by that. I mean, I believe that God has created a system of authority on the planet. And whether he has a specific guy in, in you know, there, or more likely, or I should say, is it perhaps more likely that God has created this a position of authority People go into that position and then he holds them accountable for what they do in that position. Wow. We could drink a lot of coffee and talk about this all night. I just am curious about that. However, um, the Apostle John wrote this in 1 John 5, 19. We know that we are children of God and that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. Now, this is interesting. So even straight up evil regimes, like let's just say one, let's call North Korea evil. I, to me, it's evil incarnate, right? They received, it is Kim Young Sun or whatever his name is. Um, what is his name? Tom, Kim, Sun, Un, Un, Yoon, Sun, Smith. <laughs> Could you put the actual, his title under here? Thank you, Tom, when you had it. Yeah, thank you. Um, I believe he receives his authority from God, but not God's approval. Interesting, yeah? Think about that. You can pause the tape there if you want and just think about that. Though he receives authority from God, he does not have God's approval. Thus, Paul goes on to say, if you rebel against authority, you're rebelling against God. I know you all have a yes, but going right there. Um, and particularly us as 21st century Americans, we sort of rebel against that idea. In fact, we rebel against that idea so much that we held a revolution um, 200 and some odd years ago to kick out the God-given authorities, the Brits. Now, were we rebelling against God in the American Revolution? Well, look, as a patriot I am, I'm like, no way, man. That <laughs> so how does it work? Well, there's an easy answer I'll get to later. Just kidding. Okay. Uh, but in verses three and four, he says God's intention is that rulers keep the good. In verses three and four, let, let's just read them briefly. Um, Consequently, he who rebels against the authority is rebelling against who God has instituted. Basically, what he's talking about here is this. Even the unsaved, unbelieving ruler are tasked with maintaining peace maintaining justice, maintaining orderliness. And for the most part, they do. Um, even extremely um, evil empires uh, or go oppress oppressive governments, think like uh, Saudi Arabia as an example, uh, they do have a moral code against uh, crime, et cetera. And, you know, we could argue all day, you know, where do the, you know, on the scale, are they more evil than good or whatever, but they do maintain the peace, they, they maintain um, business, they, they create infrastructure, uh, sewage systems, you know, basically as we're gonna get to when we get to taxes, they tax and they provide service, okay? Um, however, a lot, if not all, governments mess this up. Uh, we'll get to that in a little bit too. 
but for the most part, God has given them authority to sort of maintain order and peace. And Paul is saying we need to respect that even if we disagree with quite a bit of what else they do. And then he says, obviously, um, for otherwise, you might face punishment and conscience, obviously punishment from a worldly government and conscience from being disobedient to God. Yes, but, right? Everybody's got a, yeah, but. Well, let me, here's the word I used in all capital letters and in bold ink. There is a huge caveat, as you're aware, to everything that we just heard from Paul there. And the reason I say that is because there is tons of civil disobedience with God's approval all through the Bible. If you go all the way back to the book of Exodus, the Jewish midwives had been commanded by Pharaoh to kill all the male Jewish children. And they did not do that. So are they here in sin or not? Uh, from Exodus chapter 1, verse 17, the midwives, however, feared God and did not do what the king of Egypt had told them to do, they let the boys live. Daniel, Shadrach, Mishnach, and Abednego, Abednego refused to eat the king's food to not break the Mosaic or Moses dietary law, and they refused to bow down to the idols. And when the Jewish leaders of Jerusalem warned Peter and John not to teach about Jesus, they replied this, Judge for yourselves whether it is right in God's sight to obey you rather than God. For we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. And then later on, Peter and the other apostles replied to the um, Jerusalem leaders, we must obey God rather than man. Whew. Okay, so there we have clear biblical um, um, illustrations of believers who said God is a higher authority. And so when necessary, we must rebel against the orders of a worldly government. Now, when we're looking for guidance, I want to quote you a couple people. Uh, John uh, MacArthur said this, regardless of the failures of government, many of them immoral, unjust, and ungodly, Christians are to pray and live peaceful lives that influence the world by godly, selfless living. Like the Old Testament prophets, we both have the right and the obligation to confront and oppose the sins and evils of our society, but only in the Lord's way and only under his power. And another quote, this one from R.C. Sproul, but even if Christians find themselves in the unenviable position of being under the tyranny of an unrighteous and unjust government, they still have a fundamental responsibility to render civil obedience. Now, we obviously have some challenges here. Uh, and that does not mean if the government tells us to do something that we feel is highly immoral uh, or against God's law that we are to do that. No, we, in that sense, we are to be obedient to God and God first. And so I actually would like to submit to you that we really shouldn't make too big of a deal about this, that we should actually, well, I'm gonna get to that at the very end. Um, of the lesson and kind of as I sum everything up. But just so you see, we, just to give you a couple of examples here in our own country um, of sort of civil disobedience due to a higher calling. Uh, some people have been um, conscientious objectors. Uh, I also even thought about that gal. She was that clerk, uh, I forget in what county, who refused uh, to uh, process um, homosexual marriage certificates, even though that was her job. She said, I'm happy to do everything else that this job requires, but I cannot in good conscience do that before God. There's, an, there's just a small um, example. And then there's one final challenge tonight, everybody's favorite, but this one's actually pretty easy, I believe as well. And that of course is taxes. And did I write, did I write the, I didn't do the verses. Let's just read them. They are um, verse, Gosh, boy, it's dark here, Tom. <laughs> okay, verse uh, six through seven. This is also why you pay taxes, for the authorities are God's servants who give their full time to governing. Give everyone what you owe him. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, respect. If honor, then honor. Well, that's really interesting. It's not just taxes, but it's honor if, or, and respect. If a governing authority does not deserve your respect, don't give him respect. If he doesn't deserve your honor, don't give him honor. But if he deserves your respect, give it to him. If, he does, if you owe taxes, pay them. Now, this is really interesting um, because it does two different things here. Um, 
some people can make legitimate arguments against paying taxes. However, clearly Christians are absolved um, from the ethical responsibility of what the government does with that money. Isn't that interesting? Uh, because some people have, have used that case before. Well, I'm not going to pay my taxes to support the evil that this government is doing. And yet, I believe what this verse teaches is fascinating. It says, no, no, you pay your taxes in good conscience because God has placed this authority over you. And what that government does with its taxes is between that governor, as it were, and God. Isn't that interesting? Now, we all, of course, know, you know what Jesus said when they... Um, said, you know, should we pay taxes or not? And there's a really great lesson in there when he says whose image is on there. And of course they say Caesar. And then he says, well, give to Caesar what is Caesar's. But you give what is God's to God. And the reason he says that is because on that coin was an image of Caesar. And he says, then give it back to Caesar. But you understand that we as believers believe that we are made in the image of God. And so he says, give to God what is God's. And that is us. We give our lives to God. We give taxes um, to Caesar. And by the way, think about how foul uh, the Roman government was at the time that Jesus walked around. And yet Jesus said, yeah, basically pay your taxes, but give your life to God. Doesn't Jesus just always have the greatest answers for everything? So, I could actually wrap up a little early tonight, Tom, and I know that sounds crazy, probably because I allowed so much time for questions and comments, but without you all here, we're gonna end early. But I wanna end it tonight's study like this. Um, remember I told you earlier that there was a simple answer to all of this, and the answer is simply this, I don't know. <laughs> and here's what I mean by this. Um, I don't have the answer, nor do I think I want to have that kind of power in your life, um, at, even as your pastor, um, to say, here's when you are to be obey and when you are to declare war on the British, right? Like 200 years ago, right? Um, at what point do we stockpile arms to fight our government in the name of God or in the name of good over evil? Yeah, I want to trust that you have a Holy Spirit, I have a Holy Spirit, and when the time comes, we will know the right thing to do, and each man will have to stand before God uh, and bear um, witness to his own conscience um, regarding that. However, because I have your attention, let me pontificate for a minute and tell you how I see it. First of all, I want you to know this. Uh, I'm a patriot. What I mean by that is I love America. I think it's perhaps the greatest country in the history of the, of the planet. And I say that as a guy who has studied quite a bit of history. Um, we have freedoms as 21st century Americans that Paul himself could have never dreamed of. Um, I, you know, I always like to think, who did Paul vote for? And I think the answer is nobody. <laughs> I don't, I'm actually not clear about that. Perhaps he did vote for his local senator or whatever. And, you know, we know that, you know, they had a political system in Rome. My point is this. I believe as 21st century Americans, we probably have um, freedom at unparalleled levers, uh, levels of any other time in history uh, where we can speak our minds. We can be involved in the political process. And praise God, we have the right to vote. I also want to submit to you this. I'm also deeply interested in the political process. If you've ever talked politics with me, you'll know that I am at least minimally well-informed. Is that a, that's a paradox. I'm minimally informed, but I read the papers every day. I'm interested. I read what happens in Washington and um, in the state capitol every election. I study the issues. I read, uh, go to the websites of the candidates. I vote for to see their positions, and I try to vote the best I can but I want to submit to you this tonight. I am fully destined to live out my life being governed by sinful men and women who are prone to fallenness, as is all of creation. In fact, I would even submit to you that the chances are they ended up in their position due to a desire for power. And I would submit to you that even the most mature Christian who finds himself in office would struggle with the temptation of power and, and struggle with the temptation to make, um, what's the word I'm looking for, Tom, uh, compromises to effectively govern. And therefore, I believe that's why we should be praying for them. But I also would submit to you also, what Christian in the course of history 
hasn't lived under a sinful fallen government. Can you think of right now a solid Bible-believing, godly, Christ-honoring government in the history of mankind? Nope, me neither. <laughs> I can't think of one, <laughs> right? We are all called to live in this world, but not be of it. And we might not, while we might not always agree on the specifics, when to rebel, when to obey, which part of that, the clear teaching I believe, and I believe this is true, the clear teaching here from Paul tonight is we, at our root, should basically be good, upstanding citizens. We should work, um, we should pay our taxes, we should obey the laws, and I would even add this as 21st century Americans, we owe it to God to vote and to voice our opinion. I believe that's what John MacArthur meant in his quote, we should call out evil when we see it, we should praise righteousness where we'd see it, we should call our country to the highest possible godly standard, and we should let people around us know that. However, ultimately what I believe is most important to God and what we will be judged on is not what political party we have embraced or who we voted for, but rather how obedient we were personally to his law. And what is his law? <laughs> what is his greatest commandment? That we should love him with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. Now, I know you know that verse and it's easy for me to just blow by those things, but if you think about what it means to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, that truly means to live out his commandments as citizens of the United States of America, or perhaps some of you are from Canada, I understand, yeah? To live out our lives first and foremost in love of him and to love our neighbors as ourselves. What that means to me is this, we all have our opinions about the government, this and that, we all would like to be influential at the highest levels, but sometimes the most impactful thing we can do is to love the people that are closest to us because we do so being obedient to God. Um, here's kind of a dumb quotation, an example of that, but I came across this quote years ago from Julian Lennon, you know, John Lennon's son. And this is what he said about his dad. You know, my dad, John Lennon, could talk about peace and love out loud to the whole world, but he could never show it to the people who supposedly meant the most to him, his wife and his son. And I thought to myself, what use is it to have a correct political opinion and to vote for the correct guy or demand what we think is the correct legislation if we're not loving those who are right around us, our, our very families, our church families, and our unsaved neighbors. So let us use the freedom that we have to speak our minds, to exercise our right to vote, but always remember according to these verses, pray for our leaders, be loving to those immediately around us, whether they be enemies, as, as Paul said in the first part of tonight's lesson, lesson, to repay evil with love, whether friend or foe. And most importantly, I believe tonight, Paul is telling us this, pray. Pray for our enemies, pray for our leaders. And I think if we do that, we will be obedient to God and we will bring him glory. Let's close now and let's pray for our country and for those who persecute us. Father God, thank you for tonight's lesson. Father, I would say this is a hard lesson um, because we are called to do what is um, against our nature to do, and that is to pray for those who persecute us, to show love who, to those who make it difficult for us to love them. But our role model, of course, is you, Jesus. Um, you loved us when we were yet enemies to you. And so, Father, we uh, take this challenge now and we seek to love those who are enemies to us. Father, now as citizens of the United States of America, we corporately come together and pray. Father, we pray for our leaders, particularly in this difficult time of this pandemic, Lord, of, of conflicting information, God, of um, a time difficult to see clear through. Father, we all have our opinions about what rights we should be enjoying and what we should not be, what is the best. But Father, we put all of that beside us right now, Lord, and simply pray 
for those who are above us in authority. We pray for our president, our senators, our congressmen, our governor, and our mayor, and even our council, God. We pray for them. Father, have mercy on them. Father, give them courage and strength to be obedient to the to your will, God, to use the authority that you have um, given them, God, to give you glory and to do what is right. And in the meantime, may we be busy ourselves, speaking our minds, exercising our right to vote, and most importantly, God, loving you and loving those around us. We pray all these things in your precious name, Jesus Christ. Amen.